generally we all think of god and we think god is this quite strict person who punishes you when you go wrong and blesses you when you go right as somebody who is watching us 24 by 7 and uh, you should be careful with in some ways it creates a distance in the mind one thing swami does he makes god relatable really i mean it doesn't matter which age you are who you are he captures everybody with his laughter and love once he hijacks your life he gets so much into your life now the goal changes now swami becomes the goal life becomes the excuse to go to that goal my humble pranams at bhagwan's lotus feet I would first like to thank Bhag- Bhagwan to be such a wonderful god who has touched all our lives and allowed us to love him however imperfectly. I also would like to thank the organizers of this event who have been my own students too <laughs> for their warmth, their affection and how comfortable they have made me feel. as if time hasn't passed i thank the audience for having come on a sunday afternoon knowing that commuting in bombay is no joke i thank you for coming i was wondering what would be the topic which we should speak on which will be less about me and more about the audience and i thought of one theme it is how god enters our life i'm sure on this podium multiple people have spoken about varied experiences but at the end of the day they all boil down to common elements and those elements can be just faith devotion surrender the theme with all our love stories with god are made up of and so i thought other than the experiences let us share these elements again and again because those are the things we all have in common my topic as i chose is when god enters our lives god enters our lives in multiple ways for some people it's dramatic for some people they just grow up with god around them there's no bang to it but then we all wake up to god at some point of time in our lives so if i compare my parents with me my parents had this what do you call as the aha experience <laughs> while for us we grew in that atmosphere so i'm going to take you back for this dramatic entry the year 1974 month of october my sister was a baby of 7 months old she got a virulent attack of gastroenteritis at that point of time and she had diarrhea continuously some 40 motions and odd and she became extremely sick at that point of time and this is a much older version of her and when she was that sick uh, my parents got very panicky we were in pune then and midnight they went to a hospital uh, there was this doctor fadke there a very well known child specialist and when he saw the baby and immediately he started things necessary to save her life after a few hours he called my parents and said to them see you people are educated so let me tell you the truth we don't have a real cure for what this baby has we are just replacing whatever the virus does so we are constantly uh, giving her the fluids which her body is losing and giving her mycins to fight it but we cannot promise anything so please pray to your god around that time my parents were just introduced to swami by a common friend and these friends have remained friends with you know sai friends remain lifelong friends 
people may come and go, but when the bonding with others is made on the basis of Bhagwan, that bonding hardly fades. So this uh, introduction to Swami was made by them to my mother and they used to constantly speak of Swami in their houses. Because my parents were not so inclined, they politely listened. But when a crisis comes in your lap, it's a different story. So my mother started praying fervently, Swami, I don't know who you are, Sai Baba, if you are God, please save this child. It, they were in the hospital for a long period of time and one Sunday afternoon, my mother kept this baby on her lap and slowly in front of her eyes, the baby turned blue. My sister was a rather fair baby and so the darkness, which we think is the pal of death, you know, it's very dark. She knew something was wrong, but didn't know what it was. So she panicked. She picked up the child and kept calling people out. And there was a matron, an old lady in a white sari. She called her and she said, can you hold my baby? I'll go and speak, call the doctor. So they said, it is a Sunday. There is no doctor available. There's an intern. And by the time you call a doctor, it'll be half an hour. So... I don't think that's a wise thing. And that lady, she just told my mother, give me your baby, you know, she literally pulled her uh, child out of her arms, put it on her lap and kept chanting. My mother didn't know what to do. So she just, a young mother, she just sat there and started praying because that was the only thing to do at that point of time. Suddenly, the blue washed off and a healthy color returned to the child. It was obvious, the child was saved. And then that lady gave the baby back to my mother and she said, you know how lucky you are that I was around? And then she revealed that she was a Vithoba devotee and she used to walk from Alandi to Pandarpur. And in the course of those walk journeys, she had a vision of Vithoba. And Vithoba blessed her saying that in your lap, no child will ever die. And so this lady joined the child speciality hospital so that she can save as many lives as she can. So this was a dramatic entry and the irony of it is later Swami made my sister a doctor with the explicit job of saving. Well, to whom much is given, much is demanded. So this is the way Swami entered my parents' life. And then, you know, it's always like that when Swami enters your life. There is vibhuti, there are dreams, there are messages and the romance increases and increases. So that's how it happened. But for us, I was about four years old when all this happened. So I just grew up in an atmosphere which was full of Swami. There was bhajan, there is balvikas, there was everything. And when I remember, I see Dharmakshetra, I remember the number of times we practiced here when Swami came, the band, you know, the music practices and this whole thing was a huge hall, the crowd used to spill and if you saw, saw even a glimpse of Swami, you felt happy those days. Just the crown of hair, just that orange robe and your day was made. This was the blessing this place started, you know. I always think all of Swami's uh, places of residence and like this Dharmakshetra is so imbued with His presence that when you come there, the mind comes automatically. You can feel that. So when my journey to Swami, though it began in all purposes here, you don't wake up to God till some time. Mine happened in Anantapur. Anantapur, <coughs> what happened was, the first thing that I changed was my concept of God. You know, generally we all think of God and we think God is this uh, quite strict person who punishes you when you go wrong and blesses you when you go right. God is used as the ultimate, uh, uh, you know, disciplinary measure for all children. Swami won't like this, do this, Swami doesn't like this. So, in general, we create this image of God as somebody who is watching us 24 by 7 and uh, you should be careful with. 
In some ways, it creates a distance in the mind. When I went to Anandpur, I discovered that this God was anything but that. He was fun. Around him was joy. He used to be mischievous. He had jokes to play. He had so many things to do. There was a youthful excitement around him. Anything but a judgmental God. I'll just recount a few experiences of all the fun we used to have with him. When Swami used to come to Anantapur, which is usually around the month of Jan, the message will come very suddenly. You never know when it is, is coming. Everybody is in anticipation, but then you never know where the deed is. And the usual procedure is to be like this. We had a phone which was in the lobby. This phone will ring stridently, you know, a loud ring will come. Everybody will freeze. Every phone call, everybody freezes because you don't know what is the message coming. And then our then warden, Jemma Madam, she will slowly walk towards that phone. And then she will pick it up with deliberation. And she will speak in her stylish manner, yes, Anantapur hostel and everything. After she finishes her conversation, she will put the phone back again deliberately and begin to clap. The girls will rush out into the corridors because we know what this is. And then she say, Swami is coming tomorrow. And then you had a almost <laughs> yelling, you know, with joy. And then you will not recognize the hostel because it becomes a flurry of activity. People who never do things also will do. Entire hostel will be like a mad wedding flurry, you know. Cleaning, you know, like uh, things like people will climb up any heights to clean. And the dining hall floors are washed, the corridors are washed, the roads in Anandpur are washed. And then there will be columns put. So by the time this whole thing settles, it will be midnight. Sometime at one or two o'clock. That too, after great scolding, the girls will go to sleep. The next morning, everybody is washed, ready, by four. All baths done. Supravatam has greater volume that day. Nagar Sankirtan has the best participation. And around seven-ish, Swami would come in his car and uh, the Vedam, the band, everything would be there. Swami would go to the common room and he would have breakfast there with the teachers. And after that, Swami would go slowly to the auditorium. And there we will have all the programs, the discourse and everything. Swami would then come to the prayer hall, sit with the girls and talk to them for a few minutes and go to the dining hall, have lunch and then leave. So this whole thing was from 7 to about 3 in the evening, that long. We used to be in dramas most often and one such uh, occasion, we were in the play, we finished our drama and Swami went to the dining, uh, to the prayer hall. The prayer hall sessions were very special because Swami will pick up some conversation, talk to so many girls. It was something which you don't know what will happen. And so we didn't want to miss it. So what we did, we decided we are not changing our costume, we are just going with our costumes to the prayer hall. So we made it. Now everybody was seated in the prayer hall and Swami was sitting and you know the doorway was like that and we had to come in one after the other. So we had to be really discreet. So one after the other, one one character was entering. <laughs> I was the last and I was a, a Russian soldier or something in that play. So I was in beard and coat and everything. So I was slowly crawling inside and Swami suddenly said, boys are not allowed. And I looked behind to see who are the boys. <laughs> and then Swami says, you, you only you. And then I, I was so embarrassed, I sat down there itself. And I remember once, you know, we had this uh, makeup to put. We used to have this special glue which we had to paste all our face and then stick hair on, on ourselves. So I had put my mirror on the window and I was doing this job. I stuck one side moustache fully. Suddenly, I saw Swami going down that uh, passage. So I pulled out the mirror and I was, I didn't expect him to look up. Suddenly, he looked up, he saw me with half a moustache. And then he said, where is the remaining part? <laughs> <laughs> he 
you know, he would do things like that. And after, I remember even, ja I used to think this is all only for us, but Jaima Madam used to tell us some brilliant experiences. And she told us one story about how when she was a little girl, uh, that time Puttaparthi was not so, you know, had not many amenities. So what happened was Swami, uh, when they used to go for darshan, they had to go to bath till Chitravati and everything. So Jaima Madam had a practice, she would pull out her diamond earrings, give it to her mother and then go for the bath. So one morning she did that and she went, she gave it to her mother and went. She came back from the bath and then she asked her mother for the earrings. Mother said, when did you give me? She said, I gave it to you. And mother said, no, you never gave it to me. From when did you start lying also? A big thing ensued between the mother and daughter. And Swami came and started putting some more fuel to the fire. Diamond earrings, don't you have to be careful? This is not the way to behave. And I think... Jamada was so overcome that she was going on insisting, I gave it, I gave it. And then she saw Swami's eyes, there was this twinkle of mischief. She kept looking at him and he did this with his eyes. And then she saw on his robe, as his button, were her earrings. And then she understood Swami had taken the form of her mother, picked the earrings just to play like Krishna. So she used to tell us these amazing stories of how Swami used to play with them. And that's one thing Swami does. He makes God relatable, really. I mean, it doesn't matter which age you are, who you are, who doesn't like a good laugh. He captures everybody with his laughter and love. Once we change our concept of God, you know, end of the day, we are all uh, selfish beings. Our main question is, does Swami know me? You know, He may be God, He may be everything. We need to be personal with this God. So when the more and more I used to hear these stories in Anandpur about Swami, I used to start thinking, theek hai, but I am just a roll number. There are 500 students in this place. How does Swami know me? I am imagining He knows me, but does He really know me? You know, all these <laughs> doubts would come into our mind. And then one day what happened was I was sitting in the, you know, a college is a round building and it has this huge ground behind it. And end of the ground, there's just wilderness and fringed with blue hills. It's a beautiful scene. And especially if you come from a concrete jungle like uh, Bombay, the sight of even plain earth is a miracle. <laughs> so I used to make it a point to sit there and watch the sunsets. You, know, you have amazing sunsets over there. And I was thinking, you know, this relationship between God and man is like this sun and us only. The sun is millions of miles away, but the warmth is felt. Maybe God and us is like this only. We'll never be near God. God will be far away, but we'll feel his warmth, we'll feel his love. And this is the way we relate. So this was like making peace, you know, with yourself about basic questions. And that day, <coughs> what happened was, later, then I heard the prayer bell, I went for prayer and the day ended. That evening, very evening, when I was sitting on the stairs and looking at the sunset, Swami had called my father for an interview in Puttaparthi. It was some official meeting, they were discussing so many issues and suddenly Swami asked my father, you have a daughter in uh, Anantapur? Yes, Swami, I have a daughter in Anantapur. Then he said, uh, she sits on the stairs and draws me. Okay, that we don't know. <laughs> then Swami said, you tell her, Anantapur is full of my presence. If her heart is open, she will receive it. So he actually answered two questions. Number one, he knows you. Without doubt, he knows everybody. I remember in one discourse, Swami said, people ask, how does Swami know everybody? It's not possible. And Swami says, if an ant moves on your body, don't you know it? And this is, the universe is God's body. A slightest thing on it, God will know. Where is the doubt in that? And the other thing which he showed was, how the presence of God is actually everywhere. You need openness to it.
The other thing which Anandpur taught me also was how God and life are not watertight compartments. They are seamlessly one. And this is one thing which Swami teaches you. There is no distinction between work, home, uh, Swami, Sai work. There are no such compartments. Everything seamlessly flows one into the other. And the way he teaches you this is very interesting. What he does is, he makes you bring God into everything you do. You're studying, you do it because later you'll get that medal in his hands. You want to do drama, you want to sing, you want to do whatever, it comes back to Swami. Sports meet, five, five, 1,000 children, all feel that Swami saw them. He makes himself, he weaves himself into the life and that is how he teaches you to make it all seamlessly one. And I used to see how he used to do it is, on one hand he would speak a profound Vedanta, on other hand he will be like any one of us planning and fretting about things and showing tension and is everything okay, you know all those, not showing a distinction between anything. I remember once uh, we had uh, some uh, function, yeah, Swami had come to Anandpur and they give prize distribution will be there. I used to get one or two prizes and to, I used to also be in a play. So most often I used to be backstage and I had to go and take the prize from Swami whenever he calls your name, when they, they call the name. So I was in a costume of uh, a monk and I had this uh, skull cap. On a thing and a long robe and everything and I went to take namaskar and when I was taking namaskar suddenly I heard a question so I looked up and he said topi ala chesau how did you make your cap he asked me I said paper swami paper how he asked me how did you make it so can you imagine under the table I'm explaining to him how I made the cap so I told him, Swami, I took a piece of paper, I made a cone like this, I sliced the cone, then I flattened it, then I put brown paper, then I met the edges this way, something, something, I explained the whole procedure. And he was like nodding, as if it was the prime importance to know how that paper cap was made. And then I thought it ended over there. He liked the play very much and then he said, after a month we should come and do it in the boys' auditorium because there was some vice chancellor's conference. And we were thrilled to bits, firstly to enter one territory which is forbidden more than the Great Wall of China and do a play in that auditorium in front of Swami, in front of some vice chancellors was like not belonging to this earth. So we were told uh, hundred times how to behave, what to do, everything we went, very scared. When we were doing the play, we finished the play and then we were taking Namaskar and Swami. At that time we had, you know, much better costume. We had cloth caps stitched, dyed perfectly and made exactly like the abbot's cap, you know, properly tight Jewish skull cap. When I was taking Namaskar, he said, e topi bagaledu. <laughs> and then I realized that the topi story is not over and he is still referring to that. Then I looked up at him, I said, cloth, that's better. <laughs> and I wondered why he said that because there was really no comparison between the handmade work and that beautiful cap that they made it professionally. And then I realized, you know, Swami wants us, he's not particular about some show or some beauty. He wants involvement. If every child involved in the job thought of him, that was good enough. There was no need of anything else. And that's how he made it, you know, one thing, seamlessly one. There's no difference between God, life, Anything else? And I'm sure that is the experience of many devotees here. The other, this is my favorite example, you know, it's based on a scientific principle. <laughs> Basically, they call it osmosis. If you put a grape in water, it swells. Because the concentration, where there's high concentration and low concentration, it kind of equalizes. I always feel this is what happens with Swami. You know, we are like this orange high egoic concentration, full of ego, full of individuality, difference, you know, me, mine and everything. And he dips you into God. 
Now what happens is through a semi-permeable membrane called life and experience, God enters into the self, diluting the ego. I would now like to tell you how this dilution happened in our lives. First thing he did was change perception. You know, very often we, uh, because we see from the egoic point of view, we have good experiences and bad experiences, good things and bad things. If somebody told you, what do you think of an accident? It's a bad experience. But when Swami comes into it, bad can become good. Bad can become so good that it becomes like a blessing and you actually remember it again and again and again. While in ordinary circumstances, something which is very hurtful, you'll avoid it. You'll bottle it. You will not face it. But with Swami, the worst of experiences can become an occasion of His love. My parents had this experience and which impacted all our lives. This is a rather long story, so I beg your patience. I'll start where it all started. When I was a little girl, I used to get dreams. And in my dreams, I used to dream that I'm orphaned. Me and my sister, we don't have parents. And our mother's side of relatives and father's side of relatives are saying, we will take care of the children, we will take care of the children, something like this is going on. And I put it down to seeing too many movies and reading too many books because there was no meaning in this dream. And then what happened was, one day my mother got a dream. She dreamt that Swami, that time Swami was in Brindavan. And she suddenly saw him in her dream and he said, she said, oh Swami, you're back. And Swami said, no, no, I had gone to Anantapur. Those girls were not letting me come back, what to do and all that. And suddenly she noticed he had these huge patches on his head, you know, with no hair on that. So she said, Swami, what happened to you? Then he said, see, and he showed those two places where there's no hair. And then he said, uh, my mother said, you have such beautiful hair, Swami, you can cover it up. And you know, they had this conversation about hair. And this is, sounds very strange, but why I want to tell you this is because it has relevance to what happened later. This was our dreams. And then in the, in the darshan ground, Swami would suddenly call my father and say, Rao, are you ready? So, yes, Swami. Good. Always be ready. And then he told them. Suddenly one day he called him and he said, he started telling him the story of Prahlada and then the story of, um, you know, uh, you know, Mirabai, so many devotional stories. And then he said, uh, surrender should be there. If you surrender, God can interfere into your life. You must surrender. So continuously he would give these messages. We never knew this was going somewhere. Then, in February 9th, um, he called them. This was the year 1989. Swami called them for an interview. My mother, my father, uh, that picture which I showed you earlier. And my sister was in school, so she came for that interview. And Swami blessed my mother, Dirga Sumangali Bhava. He gave her a, a mango yellow sari, blessed her profusely. I think that was the day he decided to interfere into their lives. Later, people told us that Swami had already told some, some of the officials, start looking for somebody else, Rao won't be there. They were wondering what it meant, how can he not be there, he is very much there. But there was definitely something written for them. Then came the day on which this happened. Even that had some precursor. The day, a few days before that, you know, every time Swami was in Brindavan, Prashanti Nilayam would be going up and down. Early morning, three o'clock, vans will be taken and people would go to Brindavan. Seven o'clock, Swami would give darshan. After darshan, everybody would return. So this was a regular thing. And one time before this February, uh, sorry, before March, when my parents had gone to Brindavan, suddenly Swami told, all Parthi people have to go back early. And he quickly took Aarti and literally pushed all of them out early. You should go early, you should not travel late night and early morning. All this, nobody took it more than that. 
It seems the night before they were to leave the next day, people would come and give letters to whoever is going. So Bhagya sir was there, who's our neighbor. He came to give a letter to my parents. He knocked at our door, my mother opened the door. He gave the letter and when he was giving the letter, he suddenly stared at her for some time. She said, what happened sir? He smiled, he gave it. Later he told us that he heard a voice, this is the last time you're seeing her. So he felt a tinge of uh, thing. We had Kuppu Swamis, another professor who used to live opposite us. That night he got a dream that he was carrying dead bodies. So he came and told his wife, I dreamt this, she said, I am also coming with you to Parthi tomorrow. So the next morning, about three vans, van load of all the teachers and students left for Parthi, uh, Brindavan. They had reached Chikbalapur, they stopped there for a cup of tea and our, the particular van in which my parents were travelling, that guy was driving like Ben-Hur and <coughs> they were telling him, go slow and everything. The boys, uh, two boys were there in the van, they were joking, this rate we will reach Kailasha faster than Vrindavan, and they were joking. Then they got into the van and they were, they crossed uh, Chikbalapur, they were going further. I think they were closer um, to Bhagyapali, I'm, do, I'm not, uh, no, beyond Bhagyapali, right? So when they were travelling, my mother closed her eyes and she saw Swami, clearly, you know. She was thrilled, she got up to see whether it's a dream or real. Again she closed her eyes, she could see him that close. Then she told her neighbour, you know something, if I close my eyes, I can see Swami. She didn't finish that sentence. This van was going at a high speed, there's a lorry coming from the opposite side. And this uh, uh, van driver wasn't giving way to the lorry and the lorries, you know, they don't believe, they are the kings of the road. So he wasn't uh, budging either. The last minute our van swerved. But in the swerve, the timing was wrong, so the lorry hit the back of the van. So in that speed, the van began to toss three times over and landed with its wheels above. My mother said that the, all the passengers, they were tossed in that and the, you know, those, those matador vans had these uh, chairs with the iron bars, so everybody got hurt in the bargain. She said when she first came to B, she saw the roof of the van was filled with a pool of blood because everybody inside got injured. She said, I crawled out, she crawled out. And then she realized that her head was torn, jagged by the metal uh, chair. Exactly the same places where she saw in the dream of Swami's patches on his head. And the miraculous thing was she had absolutely no pain. So she was completely aware. She crawled out, sat down, began to push the blood off her face because she had streaming blood. So she was wiping her face to hold it and see what's happening. She was very much about. Now, a lot of people got injured in that uh, thing. My father hit his eye, his, uh, he broke his ribs and had an injury on his head. And because his eyes were hit, he couldn't see. So he was asking for where she is. She hit her jaw, so she couldn't speak. So she was telling him, I'm here, but you know, that way. And two boys uh, uh, who didn't get much injury, they immediately started trying to help people to come out. And one of them later told me, he brought water to pour on my mother and he was so taken aback when he saw the amount of blood on her. And she was telling, chant Sairam, chant Sairam to him. He really passed out <laughs> when he saw that. In the meanwhile, the other van which was coming, that lorry driver, after he hit them, he went ahead because he was going in the opposite direction. He saw the next van. He said, Tumare logon ko accident ho gaya hai, jao. He informed him. That was the good thing he did. That vehicle came and then they picked people up and Kuppu Swami sir was in that vehicle. He had dreamt that he'll pick up bodies, he literally did that and they took them to Chikbalapur. In the meanwhile, Swami was told that this happened and Swami immediately sent, you know, there's one part of God, Swami, which saves people. There's another part of Swami, which is all simultaneous. 
he's so human and concerned. And he's extremely practical. He immediately he got the doctors, the medical things necessary, the funds necessary, sent them uh, calls to the hospitals, everything like how it's usually done. So the doctors landed immediately. They began to look at each person, saw whose damage was to what extent and decided who goes to the bigger hospitals. So my mother was brought, uh, because she was completely, she could tell uh, what happened, she was lucid. So there was no internal brain injury, that was just a surface wound. So they brought her to um, Brindavan. Around, this happened 5.30 in the morning, by 11 they were there in Brindavan and Swami 20 times he rang up, have they come, have they come, have they come. Finally, as soon as they all landed, he came to the hospital. Uh, mother was so messy with the, all this blood and thing, caked with all that. And you know, that's one thing very nice about the Sai family. They're so sensitive to small details. So immediately they were covered up completely except the face, so that the blood is not seen by Bhagwan. He knows, not that he doesn't know, but those are the decorums of doing things. And then uh, Swami said, um, drink some water, you didn't eat anything, will you drink little water? And she was like, because the whole mouth is lacerated and there's blood going down, so. And he said, coffee, we'll give you coffee. And when she thought of hot coffee going down that throat, uh, she wanted to say no. Behind Swami, when sir was standing, he said, take it, why? Take it. Because when God pours something in your mouth, it's life. It's not coffee, it's not water. So Swami cooled the coffee and poured it in her mouth and he told, don't worry, I'll take care of everything. And you won't believe it. We were in college and hostel, we were doing our exams. Swami arranged who will pick up whom, what time will land in Brindavan. We got phone calls telling not to worry, he's taking care, write the exams properly. Day to day monitoring, after we came to Brindavan, where we stay, what we eat, when we go for darshan, when we should go to hospital to see our parents, everything was monitored. The love of this God, what to say. Now this whole experience, it passed. And then we asked Swami, why she didn't have pain? She had 120 stitches after that on her head. And Swami said, karma has to be gone through. But when devotion is there, then I can nullify the impact of karma. So you go through something without actually going through something. And what you go through becomes a joy just because it is associated with God. So the thing which God does is, our good-bad definition, He jolts it. There's no point in saying this is good, this is bad, because He can do anything. And my mother, she freely told Him, Swami, if this is the amount of grace we will get for accident, I don't mind one more accident also. And then Swami said, Chusava, kashtam lo sukham, sukham lo kashtam undi, He said. So in great joy you can have sorrow, in great sorrow you can have joy. Can you see that? This is the God of Swami, the God part of Swami. Come what may, He will hammer in the lesson. This is the lesson to learn. So, when God enters our life, our definitions of life change. Our concepts change, our perception of life itself changes. And so, the more He is part of our life, we look at the same things in a different perspective. And that is the greatest blessing, I think, that Swami gives our... Uh, this is another thing that Swami does. He changes your goals. This is something which I repeat very often, but I think it's of importance, so bear with me. Normally, in human life, we have goals. I have to become this, I have to live like this, I should do this. And what we do is, we use God as support service. Swami, give me this job, I will do this. Swami, please save my child. Swami, do this for me. Swami, do that for me. So we use God as a means to get our goals. But what Swami does, once He hijacks your life, He gets so much into your life, 
now the goal changes now swami becomes the goal life becomes the excuse to go to that goal swami give me a job so that i can do swami's work swami give me a spouse who will understand that we have to serve you swami you are first rest of it please adjust to that see the change subtle change of goals which happens however this choosing of god has its fire i mean it has a little bit of testing while our god is extremely generous and gives us tremendous grace marks he expects at least little effort from us <laughs> if you notice every time you get a chance to come to god parallelly he'll give another choice which is equally lucrative or more lucrative i remember when my father he changed from industry to teaching simply because he wanted to come to swami when we used to go from bombay he gave a letter to swami i want to serve you i want to use my life to serve you 14 years later swami called him to come for the job and that also was miraculous because uh, they swami started mba he wanted somebody to act as a dean so he, uh, they asked many institutions uh, who can suggest a dean it so happened that <laughs> all the institutions where they asked the people whom they asked knew my father and knew he was a satya sai devotee so they said you take him on so without interview anything he straight got the letter to come and join at that point of time after finishing his uh, phd in niti he had moved back to industry and he had signed a bond to work so it was not ethically right to leave that employer even though what you have waited all your life has come there so he came to swami and said swami please give me one year i'll finish that and i will come i swear i will come just keep that open for me the time when my father had to come immediately he got an offer from japan asking him to come of course it was no choice because we had decided this is it but he gives this choice i'll give you another instance when my sister was doing medicine <coughs> she was studying medicine like any other college outside you know there is bribing there is everything that goes on after 4 years of medicine when they give their final exam a word was passed among all the students that this much money has to be paid if you want to pass 150 students only 5 did not pay of the five of course my sister was one of them two did not pay because they couldn't afford it three did not pay on principle now before this what happened was swami called us for an interview and my mother said swami i want to go to take care of the younger daughter her exams are coming swami said what will you go and do there so she said swami i'll cook for her and i'll make sure that she studies what can you do if anything has to be done it's me he said this we didn't know what this meant that time after we went there this whole thing happened my sister rang up my father and told him see this is what they are saying and everybody has paid except a few of us i'm sure they will fail me is that okay with you all my father said you are a satya sai student you have to come back and see swami's face remember that course gaya gaya you lose four years we don't mind you are not compromising on this for any reason fine everything was settled but she was tense whatever it is then she went for the exam swami said no if anybody has to do anything it has to be him she said something happened to her that day she did brilliantly in all the you know the vivas the tests and the, you know they have diagnostic tests everything they gave her a difficult case she cracked it she impressed the external examiner to such an extent that he was going on openly praising her and he gave her a grade so high that even you know you have both um, valuing though the internal grade was given low because she didn't pay the money her external grade was so high that she actually passed in the battles of life if you stick to a principle it's difficult to fight it 
only Swami helps, truly. And this is what He wants us to do. So, he'll, little bit He'll test and see whether you will follow the rule or not. <coughs> the next thing which happens after more and more of God comes is this desire to consecrate life to Him comes. Almost everybody feels we should do something for society, some for life, which explains why so many of you take time out of a career, of a family life and somehow make time to do service. It is an ingrained response to love. If you love somebody, you want to do something for them. So it's simple. When God comes to your life, you have to do something. It's not something, it's, let's call it involuntary behavior. It's literally like that. You feel comfortable only if you work. And if you don't go even one day, you know, the kind of guilt which operates. I mean, everybody feels we're not doing enough. So I used to be extremely... Um, this, this sketch is done by one of our students actually. One of the things which I try to make them do is to draw enough of Swami. That's one more way of thinking of Him. And I like it very much. She somehow got it. Consecrating your life to Swami, I used to think always, is choosing Him. So I used to always think, uh, whatever comes in life, you have to distinguish between yourself, your egoic self and Swami and constantly choose and that is the only way you can survive. So, one day what happened is Swami gave us an interview. He, I don't know for what reason, he, he was in that blissful mood and he looked at me and he said, what do you want? Ask. What do you want? Of course, it's like giving you a blank check. I can ask anything from a Mercedes Benz to Moksha in that bracket. But I told him, Swami, I want bhakti. And he said, why bhakti? I said, Swami, all the time you have to choose between essence of God and non. If I have bhakti, I may possibly make the right choices. So, please give me devotion. Because we all know our devotion, it's like uh, up and down. <laughs> so, better ask for, you know, long-term devotion. So, when I asked him that, he said, devotion nundi kada. Choose chese sev kada, he said. And I didn't understand. He said, you chose, you chose your life. You already decided what you want to do. So, why are you asking for more choice and devotion? And then I understood, he was talking about a pathway. You chose the direction of your life. Now, what is the need to choose more? You have to walk that. Then he said, ask for obedience. So, I said, Swami, please give me obedience. Obedience means not choosing, walking the cho choice. And that's an everyday grail, you know. Every day to remember and come back to that essence. And he was saying, enough of choosing, now you start practicing the choice. And so I think this is something common for all of us. All of us have chosen. We have chosen our God, we have chosen our path. But now the challenge lies in walking the talk. Another subtle thing which happens is... Uh, this inner alignment, you know. We all have many parts to ourselves and one part of us chooses Swami. But the rest of us, it doesn't fall in line with Swami. So the whole struggle in life is to make all our thoughts, our words, our deeds, our inclinations, our aspirations bend towards this. And I feel that also, in Kali Yuga they say, God has made everything easy. I think we can totally endorse that because He makes it really easy. What he does is, he will give guided tour. Everything he will make sure you do the right thing. So, this is one more experience that I found again and again with him. And I will just share with you uh, one or two uh, instances where this uh, alignment he taught. What I mean by inner alignment is our own uh, barriers within ourselves. He kind of slowly mends it so that we mean what we say. You know, we get authenticity in our devotion. I, uh, one interview, Swami looked at me and he said, desires, uh, this, oh, sorry, I'm just moving a bit backward forward. I used to get dreams every semester and Swami would give me a report card, how I was in that semester. 
I used to think it's my own imagination, but he used to tell me, this semester you did this wrong, you should have this behavior, you d all this. I used to dread that part, you know, you get the full report card. One day when I walked into the interview room, he looked at me and said, this semester much better. I froze. I thought it was only dreams. I didn't know it will come, even physically. And then he, when I sat in front of him, he said, less desires, good. Not too many desires, but too much anger, too much temper. And when he said this to me, my mother said, no, Swami, she hardly gets angry and all that, you know. He looked at me and said, Chip, less anger, Chipu? Like, I said, no, Swami, lot of anger. He said, I know what she does in Anantapur when she gets angry. She goes to the prayer hall and she mops from this end to that end. And which I used to do. When I used to get too angry, I would take them, remove it, you know, like work it out by mopping the, you know, you do some seva also. And you work out your anger. And I immediately went into defense, you know. So I told Swami, Swami, you only said, no, if you get angry, you should look into a mirror. You should drink a go, go, glass of cold water. I am also doing that only. I am just mopping the floor. I am not shouting at others. I am not, uh, you know, throwing a tantrum. And then he looked at me for some time evenly till all the defense died down. And then he asked me, why get angry in the first place? That silenced me completely. I had no answer for why should I get angry. For me, anger was natural. <laughs> it's a human trait. But God is not settling for us as humans. According to him, you are divine. Please behave like that. <laughs> so. Now, when I get angry, which I do very often, I don't show it, but this haunts me, <laughs> why I get angry. Swami picks on the small, small things in us, you know, to blend that into our nature. I'll tell you one more such experience. You know, we all, um, at least when you're young, I think it's more, there's a whole of this right-wrong thinking. This is correct, this is wrong, this is good, that is bad. Slowly, that will extend to people. These people are good, those people are not. So I had this full, my head was full of these ideas and I was holier than thou, all that. One day, Swami came in my dream and he was ultra good to my so-called enemies, whom I had judged. He was talking to them, he was smiling with them. Long, whole dream in the night was only them. And when I go near him, he'll turn his face away. It was complete rejection. It was very, very dramatic, that dream. I was so upset in the dream and I kept on asking him, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this for me? Suddenly he looked at me and he began to grow in size. He became so huge that I could see only his eye and the capillaries in his eye, you know, that huge. And all these people, whom I was so much against, were in him that second. I just got up with a fright. I got up, I realized it was only a dream. I drank water. I understood immediately what the message was. I am in everything. How can you even say you like this, you don't like this? Stop judgment, that's what it was. I went back to sleep and I was thinking, I can't deal with this Swami, you have to help me. Okay, I understand what you say. How do I remove this from my heart? I don't know how to do this. And I went to sleep and I, the dream continued. He came back in my dream and he was so huge, he picked up a tree and pulled it out from its roots. It was dripping, raining and he did that. The next morning it really rained in the hostel and we had a huge tree outside the hostel. The next morning when I walked out, the tree was pulled out, lying there. For me, it was not the tree, it was the symbolic meaning of the tree. Whatever negativity was taking root and growing into a huge tree in my heart, with one go, he pulled it out. He gave me a fresh start, allowing me to rebuild my emotions. This is the kind of God we have. God who can literally not only show you the goal, pick your hand, drag you along, and even if you fight him and pimmel him and say, I don't want to walk this path, he will push you along. I only hope and pray that we have, that this 
Oh, sorry. This is my recap. I'm a teacher. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a recap. So I was telling you, everything that happens with God, firstly, He enters your life. You change your concepts about Him. Slowly, after you change your concepts, you start identifying with Him. He makes life and God the same. Then He enters deeper and deeper into your life. He changes your goals. He changes your directions. Slowly, He tries to pull you to what He is. This journey of life with God, I don't know, we can ever, ever thank Him for that. There is just no words in comparison to thank Him. And I only pray and hope that all our lives are constantly dominated by God, that we have no edgeways, that He listens to no pleas, and whether we like it or not, He takes us closer and closer to Him. Thank you so much.